Hey, Kelsey. Hey, Brooke. Want to tell everyone what's happening in today's episode? Today, we are going to talk about where Thanksgiving came from, and we're going to talk about other places women were barred from. I'm sorry, what? (laughs) (laughs) All right, let's get into this. Hello, and welcome to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%, the podcast that explores what happened to the women in history class. Now, here's your host, Kelsey Brooke Eckert, and her partner in crime, Brooke Neva Sullivan. Episode 18, Thanksgiving and places women were barred from. I mean, this is big. There's a lot of things here. And yet, there's no turkey in front of me. What is happening? I don't, how dare I not bring the turkey? I mean, Kelsey, <laughs> you're going to have a Thanksgiving episode. There's no good fruity snacks. But you got water. Oh, you're so, such a hostess. Yeah, but remember, it originated with the Puritans. Oh, You know, right. so, like, water. It's a reach, but I'll allow it. <laughs> I'll allow it. <laughs> okay, so... We are not going to talk about Native Americans because... Um, what? I know. You would think. Well, so Thanksgiving, if you do a little bit of digging into it, Thanksgiving is an English holiday that was sort of like part of the harvest. It was a spiritual holiday. Okay. Um, Something widely celebrated throughout New England, but not a national holiday until around the Civil War. In New England... um, the myth, I would say, of Thanksgiving is that when, you know, the Puritans come over and settle, they meet the Wampanoag, and the Wampanoag are so excited to see them and greet them and help them, and so they sit down and they have a Thanksgiving meal together to honor this new bond. And this is just not really accurate. Of course, the Wampanoag were eager to build an alliance with the English settlers that were coming, but I think for the Wampanoag, they saw the English settlers. Well, let's flip it. I some I read an article from the Smithsonian that flipped this, and I thought it was a really perfect analogy. Okay. So if the Wampanoag had taken their boats across the Atlantic and landed in England and carved out a little bought, bought which the English did, they bought some land from the English, right? So they, they arrive in England. Yep. They buy some land from England. Um which you know the English England would never allow. Well, they might be happy to sell land and get money to make money off of that land. Oh, true. Okay. But by no means would the English ever believe that that land was no longer part of England. Right. Yeah. Right. And so the Wampanoag certainly felt the same way that like yeah, we would be happy to let you have this portion of land. Yeah, you've traveled Welcome all this way. to our country. Yeah. This you is know, our place. This is ours. And so Yes, there is, you know, and and I think the Wampanoag also thought, like, oh, well, the English can, you know, help them with some of the tribal rivalries that they have um, and and those types of things. And so while the relationship may have begun amicably, it deteriorates pretty rapidly. And on a previous episode, we talked about King Philip's War, which is this massive war that kills 5% of um, the population in this area. And it is sort of just this, like... When you teach history of Thanksgiving and you teach this sort of mythical story, you are missing kind of the end of this. First of all, that that, that it's kind of we're ma- we're making up a history because the end of that story is the massacre and expulsion of this tribe. And so, if that's what Thanksgiving is to you, then fine. Yeah, but that's not what this is about. Okay. I also think it's weird because like. The, you know, it's supposed to be this this story of the first interaction or first, you know, harvest with the English and the Native Americans that are there. And um, 
But that's not, like, Massachusetts is not the first interaction between these people. Right, no, not by any small account. No, and by, I mean, the Wampanoag had been interacting with Europeans for a long time. Um, And, you know, the Europeans had been coming all up the East Coast and raiding Indian villages, capturing people, taking them back into slavery in Europe. Um, There were already Indians in um, the, you know, there are already Wampanoag people who spoke English when the Puritans arrived based on their interactions. I mean, John Smith had mapped New England and they were carrying a map of New England. So John Smith had wandered all this territory. Um, And then you've got the Virginia colony, which like it is really the first interaction between a permanent english settlement and the native americans and that was an incredibly hostile environment yeah. um and and i think it's interesting that we start with like the more peaceful of the two options but really the one that happened first was the one that was really violent and the one that is maybe more peaceful still ended in horrifying violence what are we talking about in in size, scope, numbers? I mean, when you say 5%, how many people is that? So as a percentage that's of the population, that's more than any other war in American history. Whoa. So, yeah, which is crazy. And I don't think people, like, appreciate that. I didn't even learn about King Philip's War in school. I learned about it later when I was well, an I mean, educator. Let's think about for a minute what we all learned in school about Thanksgiving. And, I mean... Maybe it's a little more aggressive in New England because of where we are, but we all made the hats and the buckle shoes, and we sat at the table, we made Indian corn and blah, blah, blah. There was never discussion of where this came from and who it involved other than, like, let's celebrate the relationship between the British and the Indians. Right. Which is not the case, it sounds like. Well, it's... It may have been a case. I mean, it would be kind of like saying the Donner Party was this great group of people who were headed west to to create a new life for them and leaving out the part of the Donner story where they got snowed in and ate each other, right? Like, (laughs) It's like real aggressive, but I get the parallel you're making. I'm with you. But, yeah. And let's celebrate this wonderful adventure westward. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. I mean, pioneers they were. Yeah. So, I think think that a more, you know, like, let's... Let's go to the people who wanted to create Thanksgiving as a national holiday. Yeah, so give us, like, the backstory of where this comes from. All I know is Lincoln. Is that... Yeah. So, that's awesome. That's awesome that you know that. So, yeah, Thanksgiving becomes uh, a national holiday sort of under Lincoln. Um, There's petitions in the decades before, like President Taylor is petitioned. Um, but there's all it's also this time period where states' rights, right, pre, right, pre the Civil War, where states' rights are sort of a hot button issue and any infringement of the federal government on the rights of states to do whatever the hell they want is seen as, you know, not good. Even though, you know, they might be advocating to like, I don't know, end slavery just as hey, like a theory. There's an example. Yeah. Um so 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 it doesn't really get very far and it's not actually officially a federal holiday until Franklin Roosevelt which I didn't realize. Oh. Yeah. Okay. But it's introduced and uh to Lincoln and in Lincoln I I think many states adopt Thanksgiving. Okay. Um under Lincoln. But this isn't something that Lincoln came up with on his own. It was actually created... Did you just miraculously think of this? And like, no. poof, I'm a man and i just a genius? Yeah, well, I mean, Thanksgiving was a New England tradition, like I said. And so it was actually a group of women that petitioned him to create Thanksgiving holiday. What? As a women's holiday. How so? Okay, so let's back up a little bit. Yeah. And let me tell you do. about the woman behind this, behind these petitions. Okay. So... First of all, she's from New Hampshire, which I had didn't know until today. I, had I mean, randomly saw that in the reading, and I was like, oh, cool. that's really cool. So um, her name is Sarah Hale, 
And um, she was born in Newport, New Hampshire, which is uh, near Vermont-ish. You people probably think that New Hampshire is Vermont. It's not. So Sarah Hale was born in Newport, New Hampshire, and she uh, married her husband, Mr. Hale, and um, was happily married. They had five children, and he five. Yeah, oh gosh, okay. in nine years. So uh. do quick math. That's a lot of babies right in a row, and um, he dies. Oh, sad for Sarah. Sad and and scary because she has five children that she needs yeah. to take care of. So um, she begins writing poems to, like, get an income and that type of thing. And she wrote this poem that you've probably heard of, Mary Had a Little Lamb. That was actually written by someone? Yeah. Like, someone authored it. Sarah Hale. Sarah Josepha Hale. It's quite the middle name, but okay. Yeah. So Mary Had a Little Lamb. His fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. You know it! I got that one. Okay, cool. Um, so she, her writing is obviously, like, that one takes off, and it, I mean, everybody knows it. The intellect, the insight, the intrigue. I mean, Woo! It's got everything. Everything. There's a lamb, there's a little girl. We're not sure why she's alone. I mean, we could really get into this. We could. Okay. Let's not, though. <laughs> so, in 1837, she became the editor of Godey's Lady Book. Lady's Book. Uh, she wrote for the magazine all sorts of recommendations to women, poems, things like that. Um, she covered things like education to child rearing, kind of like the woman's sphere was yep. her you know, vantage point. Constantly in, in, advising. That's what Constantly like. advising. Yeah. She used her platform to support a lot of causes, uh, like the abolition of slavery. Um, she later supported um, colonizing, which was a popular idea in the time. Um, even Lincoln sort of had this idea at one point. Um, and even some African leaders, African-American leaders, um, like Marcus Garvey, were proponents of this theory or this idea, All which right, is, so what is this? to free the slaves and send them back to Africa to, like, colonize their own, like, to, to their own territory in, back in Africa. Like, it was sort of the ultimate, like, black people and white people cannot live together in peace, so let's send them back to their, their place of origin. Place of origin. Whoa. Which is... Like, people tried, and Marcus Garvey would be a whole topic in and of itself. But there were yeah. lots of people, including um, Sarah Hale, who were proponents of this whole Is idea. Is that considered a racist theory? Well, it, I, I don't, I'm not an expert on what wow. people would consider racist or not racist. But I, I think that it is sort of like... I mean, because, especially because you've got black leaders like Marcus Garvey, the Garveyites, who are huge proponents of taking people back to Africa and the Back to Africa movement. Um, I, part of me is like, well, no, because I think people really had just accepted that it was impossible. And it was radical people like Martin Luther King and um, Shirley Chisholm and other people who are saying, like, no, we can we can live together in peace. You know, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman. Sure. Um but, yeah, there were lots of people that I think didn't think that that was ever possible. Interesting. That's an interesting one. So, anyway, so yeah. she writes on this. So, she writes about that. Um, she works as an editor. She raises money for a bunch of historic sites that are actually still preserved today, um, like George Washington's home and the construction of the Bunker Hill Monument in, in near Boston. Um, so... This is kind of cool that, like, those things have stood the test. Like, those yeah. initiatives that she used her platform to propel um, stood the test of time. Well, it's obviously had a, a wide readership, which is exciting for her to get out there. But this is also kind of an amazing story in the fact that she's a single mom doing this endeavor Yeah. Um, to, you know, an intellectual endeavor in that time period. It's just very interesting. Yeah, very cool. And I think that's a theme that, like, a lot of times when women are widowed, like, you know, they have to do a lot as a result of that. Sure. And it's sort of like, you know, 
kind of like in nunneries where, you know, the, they had that ultimate excuse of like, we have given our life to God. We've dedicated our right. life here. You know, she has already done her like womanly duty and yeah. like, you know, produced a family and is raising them. But also now because of circumstance has to provide for them too. Um, so she is a little controversial to modern women because she focused a lot of her efforts on the domestic realm and talked a lot about like what is proper for women to do and that type of thing. Um, people comment on that. Yeah. (laughs) It always works out really well for them. Yeah. She obviously was probably not a proponent of, she was not a proponent of women's suffrage, um, because she felt like participating in politics would take women away from their focus, which should be on the domestic sphere and on their children's education. Um, but she is an advocate for women's education, which I feel like is, is like contradictory, but it's this idea of like Republican motherhood. And, and like, if you want to raise good patriots then you need to be educated well enough to teach your kids to be patriotic, you know? Okay. Like if you, you can only be godly if you can read the Bible. Right. Exactly. Yeah, it's a very similar idea, except now, you know, not godly, like patriotic Mm -hmm. and and that type of thing. Um, The lady's book was was really interesting, and this is not necessarily, this isn't her writing, but I just want to share this one thing. (laughs) They told lots of stories about the dangers of being unladylike. Oh, no. Please, please (laughs) share, Kelsey. I I hope we're not in violation of these crimes. (laughs) So there was one girl, Ellen, Ugh. who, in a story published in this this uh, journal, this book, was a tomboy. A tomboy. And she liked playing, and she insisted on playing rough sports, outdoors. I mean, Ellen, get your shit together. Come yeah. on. Her aunt warned her. She said, don't do it, Ellen. Oh, my God. <laughs> and so she was thrown from her horse and crippled for life. Oh, well... You know? That is, um, don't ride horses. <laughs> I, what's the moral of that story? Don't do rough outdoor activities, ladies. Oh, and so these types of moral stories, like, appeared in this magazine that she's writing I feel for. like I need to do, like, a, if your name is Helen and you're listening, we don't feel that way about you, and you ride those damn horses. <laughs> what? Yeah. So... Getting to Thanksgiving, men and women in this time period live really, really separate lives, and it's kind of hard to even just imagine how separate they are, Yeah. but lots of things are barred to women, and lots of things are barred to men. This is the woman's sphere. This is the men's sphere, and... When you um, say barred, like, so there's a law saying men can't do this, or there's... Or custom. Okay, so it's a social grace or social custom yeah like like if i went in and and used the men's restroom for example I mean, like is there a law you know you stopping like me standing up you got to do it i mean you just can't sit down all the time you're yeah. in a hurry <laughs> um yeah so like is that a law? Not really, but like literally I bet people. A law that women well, are after all the like yeah. trans stuff recently, like geez, Louise, people. But anyway, yeah. So so like there, but in a lot of cases, there aren't actually laws dealing with this stuff. Like don't litter. Well, that's a law. That's a law. I'm sorry, I'm trying to come up with a social custom. That's also a law. That's not a law. That's not a law. So a social custom. That's not a law. Well, here's a here's a weird one. I mean, there's lots Don't of cut in line at the grocery store. Yeah, social custom. Social custom. You Not won't get lot. glared down, right? But I think there are the separations in her time are so extreme that it would be like you'd be scolded by your parents for stepping out of your sphere, stepping out of your track that yeah, you're supposed so you to be went on. And rode a bicycle in that time. If that was not a custom, you'd be disciplined. Yeah, I don't think the bicycle is invented yet, but... Oh, come on. Come on, I know. Well, m- m- What was that game where you roll the, the wheel with the stick? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Was that was that invented yet? Because I can remember yes. a lot of Renaissance days playing with that. <laughs> um, They're like, these so, are the children's toys. You're like, what were they doing? Here's a rock. Throw it. <laughs> so fun. 
<laughs> well, let me give you a couple examples. So, um, when they would have dinner together, men would always leave the ladies and go and go, like, smoke and drink in another room. Yeah, the after dinner drink. Right, yeah. Talk politics, talk manly things um, that women weren't allowed to partake in. And um, women go to the parlors, they go to sewing rooms, and they have sort of these, like, separate spaces. Yeah, like a library. Right. Okay. And so I think a bigger example is that the 4th of July and other military celebrations Mm -hmm. were seen as men's holidays because the military was marching in the streets and this was a man's holiday. And it's hard to imagine that, like, the 4th of July is not a woman's place. Like, you can't celebrate America? You can't celebrate America, or you can from the comfort of your home, whatever you can see from the window. Oh, gross. Right. Give so, me my firecrackers, a vet- my corona, and let me, uh, yeah. let me wear my short shorts. Yeah. I have to go. Yeah. So, it's, but it's just fascinating, right? Like, this is... Like, mili- like, I don't even think of those as military holidays, but they are. And in a lot of towns, in New England at least, on the 4th of July, like, there is a parade, right? Yep. And parades come from military parades. Like, the military is marching through. So not the little wagons that come down the main street. <laughs> no. <laughs> not in originally. <laughs> yeah. That was not a thing? No. Okay, and kidding. eventually, like, they started going by women's houses because the women would, like, wave and throw handkerchiefs and things like that. But Don't these throw your booger rags at, <laughs> at me. That's gross. It wasn't COVID back then, you well, know. So I don't like care. germs. What? <laughs> you keep your snot rag in, at your house. <laughs> like I don't know. Throw me something else, like a flower. So. Women in this time don't respond to their exclusion from these by demanding to be included. This goes to show how far, like, the separation of the spheres are. Mm. Instead of demanding inclusion, women demand their own holiday. I mean, that's kind of reaching for gold. It's good. Yeah. And Thanksgiving is that holiday. Why? Because it is a celebration of the woman's sphere by cooking cooking and creating this, like, massive feast, right? I don't know that anything about Thanksgiving celebrates a woman. It's like slave labor. (laughs) Well, in a lot of homes today, and I think that people miss the history because, A, we don't talk about women's history in school. Yeah, that and it's... I, I don't know if I'm speaking for a lot of people, but I'm sure people are listening. We don't talk about any of it because it's a family holiday now. It's the one time before Christmas that we get together and we don't give gifts. Yeah. And it's enjoyable. Yeah. We eat and we meal, just talk. And we just talk and we sit together, which we never get to do. Probably not this year with COVID. But it's it's one of those holidays similar to 4th of July where there's no there's no expectation of what you give or get. Yeah. Which totally I think makes it really enjoyable. Yeah. And a and a different experience than any other holiday. But we certainly don't talk about the reason why we have that holiday. Yeah. And if we do, we talk about the mythical, like Native yeah, American exactly. version of it. And um and it really should be this celebration of the home, of the hearth, of your family. And that's the woman's sphere, right? Her children all around her, and it's a celebration of this thing that she has has created and fostered. And um all right. Right. So you. it's a really pretty thing. Um, it's a great idea. Yeah. How it's deployed, questionable. Right. And so I think given that now we that we know the origins, what a cool chance to really make it that. I think about a lot of Thanksgivings that I witness and a lot of dinners in general that I witness in in my life experience. And one of the things I've noticed is that the women do a lot of the cooking and the cleaning, the planning and the mental work and all the things that go into preparing yeah, a big hosting. feast and hosting. And, um, and I think that 
if many people realized that this was supposed to be a cel- like a woman's holiday in celebration of So are we talking this like home. Mother's Day or we don't have to do anything? <laughs> well, I'm not saying it should be, you know, like this is a celebration of, of women's work, okay. of, of the home, of domestic life. So it doesn't necessarily mean that women aren't working. Just like the men on the 4th of July, they're marching, right, with, right. Their, with their regiment or whatever. And, um, and so... It's not that they're not doing their duty on that day. It's that we're honoring that duty and recognizing right. we're, it. We're taking a moment to to celebrate. Yeah, in a modern country, you know, in a modern period where we're working towards equity, we should see equity in abundance on yeah. Thanksgiving between the genders within a household. Yeah, makes sense. But I do think, I don't know, speaking from my own personal life experiences, it is a very fair process in the celebrations. I mean, we would spend Thanksgiving usually at family's house, um, our cousin's house, and I'm trying to remember if any of the men really did anything, and they didn't, but it's, they did kind of sit around or hang out. Now, as an adult, that is kind of flipped, and... My husband cooks just as much as I do on Thanksgiving, Hmm. which is different. Yeah. I think it really just depends on the people. It depends on, you know, the dynamics that people have set up in in their homes. I know in in my family, you know, the, the... women in my family are, we want it to be the way that it's always been and, you know, whatever, like we have little traditions and things like that and the boys could not care less. And so therefore they don't engage to between hosting. I mean, if when my husband's like, yeah, we're having people over, he throws out a bag of chips and he's like, all done. Yeah. So, all right. (laughs) That's how you want to welcome people into your home. Best of luck to you. Yeah. Um, so there is a difference in thought, right? I think that goes around those traditions, but yeah, I hope that people are feeling like it's more equitable. So this Thanksgiving, everybody needs to take care of their family members and celebrate this domestic sphere. I love that. It's so like warm and welcoming and thoughtful versus thinking about the mythical tragedy and what isn't. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm in. All right, Brooke, let's take a little break, Ah. and we'll be right back. All right, fine. (laughs) For lesson plan ideas and how to teach women's history, visit our website, www.remedialherstory.com. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Remedial Herstory. If you think what we're doing is needed, please consider joining our Patreon community. Patreon allows you to sponsor a podcast with a small donation. Patrons get access to bonus materials, extended episodes, insider information, and gear. Give at whatever level you can. Patrons who give at the $25 tier will receive a Remedial Herstory mug and a booklet of all the Remedial Herstory lesson plans and resources. This episode is sponsored by our patrons. Thank you to Kent and Jamie Heckel from Ohio, Sarah Reardon from New Hampshire, Leah Tanger from Connecticut, and Bridget Erlinson from Connecticut. You guys make this show possible. Welcome back, Brooke. Oh, it's good to be back. Okay, so military parades were not the only place women were barred from. Uh, not surprised by this fact, but I'm curious what other places were. So, think anything that is, like, stereotypically male, women are not allowed to be there. Like a bar. Not a place for a woman. Well... A respectable woman, I guess. A respectable woman. But oftentimes women would have to have chaperones to come into a bar. Um, And sometimes, I mean, they would just like outright say, no women allowed. Um, Polling places were places that women were not allowed to be in. Um, It wasn't until right around the turn of the century that um, a group of women in New York started trying to challenge that idea. Um, And so even though they weren't allowed to vote, they decided to just make themselves present at voting stations and got themselves approved to be, like, clerks. Okay. Um, Which I thought was a really brilliant way to, like, like, if we... Let's 
change this whole thing of like, this isn't a place where women are. And maybe if we can get in there and be part of the voting process, then maybe eventually we can get the right to actually vote. Um, what was interesting about that history is that in polling places, they would often make it kind of like a bar. It was like the men's club. Like, people would vote literally, like, in bars. And so you would go to the men's club, you'd cast your ballot, have a couple drinks, head home, you yeah. know? And, um, but all of these places, I mean, it, you're not only dealing with the discrimination of, like, well, could I just have a drink? It's, first of all, can I get into the door? Right. Bef- can I go in? Yeah. Just inside. Just, Not even if I can have a drink. Yeah. Um, lots of places, like even the... Capitol building in the United States government did not have a women's bathroom um, available to women senators and representatives um, until very recently. Like, I want to say the 90s. So, yeah. So, like, if you're a woman and you need to go to the bathroom in the Capitol building. I feel like I I guess I have to wear depends. Yeah. See it in in chambers. See it in chambers. (laughs) (laughs) Thinking about... um, Oh my gosh, what's it called when you talk for a long period of time on the floor? Oh, uh, Filibuster. filibustering. <laughs> yeah. You're just like, I'm just going to come in and filibuster and you wear your Depends. Yeah. <laughs> Go big. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's I'm like... not leaving. Like, things like this are maybe, you know, maybe women who became senators were allowed into the building, but previously they weren't even, like, it, well, this just wasn't where you went. It wasn't where you should be. And then How so much so that they... bathrooms in that building when most of them had secretaries that were women? Yeah. That's shocking. Yeah. Where do those women go to the bathroom? Well, I don't know if that's actually true because I think a lot of the people that, like, clerked with them were um, were men, you know, were, like, like, male interns and things like that. That makes sense. So... So and, and and having women in those types of jobs, just being in politics, even if they're the secretary to a politician, is still kind of a new thing where women are working outside the home. Okay. All right. So, um... I'm always fascinated by, and this is the centennial of women's suffrage, right. and there were lots of women who did not, you know, necessarily see, like, you know, Miss Hale, who we were just talking about, Mrs. Hale, um, who did not see women's suffrage as necessary. They wished that, like, all these other things would change, you know, and, like, let's not muddy our lives by voting. Ew, that's the man's thing. You know, it'd be like wearing pants or something. Oh, Ugh, gross. As we both wear pants in pockets. Yeah. <laughs> Those things are terrible. Right. Well, my mom literally in high school had to petition the school to be allowed to wear pants to school. Like That's absurd. Right. My mom puts pockets in things that don't have pockets. Yeah. The other, the opposite of that. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, oh, give me those. I'll put a pocket put in. Put a pocket in. And they always have nice bright colors and weird fabric. I got a couple things to send her. Is oh, my okay? God. She's the pocket lady. <laughs> my mom hates purses. She thinks they're, like, dangerous. Yeah. She... Is puts pockets in everything. That's awesome. So, um, it's hard to really even imagine just like how separate people's worlds are, and that there are places that are manly. If you go there, you're manly, and if you are well, a, so the golf course, golf course. So actually, that gets us to the big thing: sports. Oh, okay. Okay, so sports is probably the biggest thing that I think of when I think of what is like stereotype male and um, and would women be allowed to go there. So at the turn of the century, mm-hmm. um, sports are actually kind of taking off because radios are um, more popular. More popular. Yeah. Newspapers uh, are covering n- it. Newspapers are covering it. You've got celebrities for the fir- really uh, like beginning to be national names. Um, it's not really till the 20s that you have big names like Babe Ruth and stuff right. like that. But like during the depression there's the boxers, there's like different tennis players that are getting popular. Yeah. So baseball though, like America's pastime. Right. And I guarantee you have heard this song. Take me out to the ball game, sung by Edward Meeker, Edison Records. Katie, Katie was baseball mad, had the fever and had it bad. Just to root for the hometown through every zoo. Katie Blue. On a Saturday, her young beau called to see if she'd like to go to see a show. 
know what Miss Kate said, no. I'll tell you what you can do. Take me out to the ball game. Wait. That's how that song originally starts? Yeah. My brother, that was the first thing he learned how to sing, was that song. Was that song. And, and my father taught my son. That is the first song he learned how to sing. Yeah. I don't know. It's a women's rights song. What? <laughs> That's the craziest thing. So her, this is a girl who loves baseball, wants to go to a game. This boy approaches her and he says, "Hey, like you want to go out to a show?" And she says, "No." You know what you can do? Take me out to a ball game. I love this so much that it's like in my family, like it's part of our culture that we sing this song to each other, and it's a women's rights song. Yeah. Hell yes. <laughs> So let me play a little more of it for you. He saw all the games, knew the players by their first name, told the umpire he was wrong all along, good and strong. When the score was just two to two, Casey, Casey knew what to do, just to cheer up the boys he knew, he made the gang sing this song, take me out to the ball game, take how did you learn the history of that song? So they just released in the last couple of years the original on YouTube, and NPR did a whole thing on it. Um, and so I heard it on my commute, and I was, like, mind blown. And then I got into work, and I don't intend to be, like, the women's rights person. I just, like, want to be equal in my yeah. classrooms. And so it cracked me up because I heard it on the radio that morning and I got in and I kid you not, like, three different colleagues came up to me and they were like, did you hear NPR this morning? <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, I got it. I'm all over it. I'm all over it. I already have YouTube queued up, playing it for the kids. Gotta go. Gotta go. Bye. <laughs> That's so funny and awesome. Yeah. Um, because... I mean, just listening to those lyrics, if you hadn't told me that it was a woman, Casey, like that. Yeah. I, I think of, like, that cartoon that you watch when you're a kid, Casey at bat. Yeah. And he strikes out and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't have pinned it together. But yeah. But I, I love that. Well, and I love it's, like, l- like let me root for the home team. Like, it's yeah. a, it's like a request. Like, let me in. Let me let me play. Yeah, let and, me yell at the umpire. Let me let me be there when the score is tied and yeah. see the game. Yeah. It's cool. I yeah. love that. So, a pretty cool um, piece of American history that I don't think many people register as women's rights. And, um, and I think it just... Like, even baseball is barred to women. Even sport, you know, just, like, just sporting events. Like, being able to just cheer. Not even participate. We're not even talking about participating. Mm-hmm. Just be in the arena. Um, and I think that's wild. And so if, you know, if that's the, bar- I mean, we already talked in the first part about women do, you know, don't do man- manly things. Don't participate. Don't yeah. do, like, and if you do, there these are all the consequences. Um, but we're talking about, like, literally getting in the door yeah. and being a fan of male athletes. Um, it's so interesting we're talking about this because I, you know, it's, you start to put two and two together and I'm sure listeners are starting to do these things too in their mind, but my grandfather was a really big track star yeah. and ran track, big deal. His mother never saw him race and now I'm putting it together that she probably wasn't allowed to go. Yeah. Or didn't think it was her place to right, be. Right, or didn't think it was her place. Like, her place was to be with, you know, my my grandfather's brother at home yeah. and raising him, and sports were not part of her world. Yeah. 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 Well, and often, like, the girls who did sports were weird and manly. And, I mean, we even see those stereotypes today. Oh, like, sure. Like, I don't want to lift weights because I don't want to, like, look manly or look whatever. Oh, and I don't lift weights because I don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a college athlete for you. Yeah, but I think that, like, there are so many women. Like, I think of all the CrossFitters and people that oh are, like, gosh. totally embracing the muscle and, and, like, and, the, fit. and, the, and the fitness of it because they are fucking badass like oh they're God. awesome they're like they're athletes like yes. those are athletes yeah um i don't know i guess and, I guess, and so beautiful like, at the same oh time yeah. maybe i just because i have that feminist lens but i see them and i just think they 
are the most miraculous humans yeah. for what they're doing. A lot of them played Amazons in the Wonder Woman oh my series. God. Isn't yes. that so cool? Please. More. <laughs> but I think it gets to, I mean, we are seeing in our time the ripple effects of the segregation of men and women and these ideas that X equals manly and, you know, something else equals feminine or yeah. female or girly. Men and women were barred from holding different jobs based on gender norms. And so um, newspapers would literally advertise, like, women's Women's jobs, jobs. men's jobs, um, jobs for Negroes, right? Like, it was not, like, like, I mean, all the the barriers that people are trying to break down um, were, like, literally displayed in the newspaper. Well, think about some that are still kind of gender-specific now that people are like, oh... What's your dad do? And he's uh, he's a nurse. You're right. Immediately, people are like, "Wait, what?" And there's, then there's the the joke um, in one of my trainings with work that I used to do was about gender bias. But um, we would do so. Uh, this boy gets into an accident and he gets wheeled into the hospital, and all of a sudden he goes into the operating room and the surgeon looks down and says, "I can't operate on on him. He's my son." Who's in the operating room? Hmm. It's the mom. Right. Yeah, I love that. And it's like people immediately say me. it's the dad. Yeah. And it's like right there is how how gender bias shows up. Right, right, right. Yeah, so. that's a really good example. So I think what's really fascinating is just how what we think of as like gender norms or social norms or whatever actually have like legal origins, right? Like yeah. these were men's jobs. These were women's jobs. These were places where men could go. Yeah. Right? Sports are men's things and politics are men's things and women's things are in the home, right? And so if it's domestic, they that is their domain. That's what they have control over. And I think um Yeah, I think understanding, just like understanding Thanksgiving's origins as a women's holiday Mm -hmm. um, is really important because it it totally shifts the way that you see that holiday. Because this isn't, this is less about Native Americans and it's more about, and and our relationship, because that's a myth. And it's more about celebrating the domestic sphere and um, the, you know, and then the other piece here is just like, when we're talking about these social norms that people are trying to break down, understanding that these are things that people were literally like barred from participating in, barred right. from being included in. And so it's a lot bigger because the consequence of not breaking down these norms is is letting that legacy of exclusion and and legal discrimination um, based on gender and sex um, stand. You know? Yeah, and be allowed all over. Brooke, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Kelsey. I'm Brooke Sullivan. I'm Kelsey Eckert. See you next time. Thanks so much for listening to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to bring more voices to the conversation. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.